Mary Fairfax, who grew up to be the most learned woman of her day, was born in Scotland in 1780. Her father was a captain in the navy, and whilst he was away with his ship, her mother, who was not at all well off, lived quietly with her children at Burnt Island, a small seaport on the coast of Fife. She did not take much trouble about Mary's education. In those days it was not thought necessary that girls should learn much. Mary was taught to read the Bible and to say her prayers morning and evening, but otherwise was allowed to grow up a wild creature. As a little girl of seven or eight, she pulled the fruit for preserving, shelled the peas and beans, fed the poultry, and looked after the dairy. She did not care for dolls and had no one to play with her, for her only brother was some years older, but she was very happy in the garden and loved to watch the birds and learn to know them by their flight. When her father came home from sea, he was shocked to find Mary, who was then nearly nine years old, such a savage. She had not yet been taught to write, but she used to read The Arabian Nights, Robinson Crusoe, and The Pilgrim's Progress. He was horrified, too, at her strong Scotch accent, and made her read aloud to him that he might correct it. This she found a great trial, but she delighted in helping her father in the care of his garden to which he was devoted. He at last felt that something more must be done to educate her, and said to her mother, Mary must at least know how to write and keep accounts. So at ten years old, she was sent to a boarding school. The change from her wild free life made her wretched, and she spent her days in tears. They were very particular in those days that a girl's figure should be straight, and used strange means to ensure this. Mary was perfectly straight and well made, but she was enclosed in stiff stays with a steel busk. Bands were fastened over her frock to make her shoulder blades meet at the back, and a sort of steel collar was put under her chin, supported on a rod which was fastened to the busk in her stays. Under these uncomfortable conditions, she and the other girls of her age had to do their lessons. These lessons were far from interesting. The chief thing she had to do was to learn by heart a page of Johnson's dictionary, so as to be able not only to spell all the words and give their meaning, but to repeat the page quickly. She also learnt to write and was taught a little French and English grammar. A year at this school was supposed to finish her education, and it is not surprising that when she got home again at the age of eleven, she could not write a tidy letter. She was reproached with not having profited better by the money spent on keeping her at an expensive school. Her mother said that she would have been content had she only learnt to write well and to keep accounts, as that was all a woman was expected to know. Mary was delighted to be free again, and felt like a wild animal escaped out of a cage. She spent hours on the seashore studying the shells and the stones and watching the crabs and jellyfish. When bad weather kept her indoors, she read every book she could find, and especially delighted in Shakespeare but an aunt who visited them found fault with her mother for letting her spend so much time in reading, and she was sent to the village school to learn plain sewing. She soon made a fine linen shirt for her brother, so well that she was taken away from school and given the charge of all the house linen which she had to make and to mend. But she was vexed that people should find fault with her reading, and thought it unjust that women should have been given a desire for knowledge if it were wrong for them to acquire it. Every opportunity for study was used by her, and when a cousin lent her a French book, she set to work with the help of a dictionary and the little grammar she had learnt at school to make out the sense of it. There were two small globes in the house, and her mother allowed the village schoolmaster to come during a few weeks in the winter evenings to teach her how to use them. She loved to watch the stars from her bedroom window, and to find out their names on the celestial globe. When Mary was thirteen, her mother spent a winter in Edinburgh, and then at last Mary went to a school where she learnt a little arithmetic and to write properly. An uncle gave her a piano, and she had lessons in playing it. 
when they got back to burnt island she used to spend four or five hours daily at her piano she also began to teach herself latin but did not dare to tell this to any one till she went to stay with an uncle who was very kind to her she told him what she was doing and he encouraged her by telling her about learned women in the past and what was more read virgil with her in his study every morning for an hour or two while staying with another uncle at edinburgh she attended a dancing school and learnt to dance minuets and reels party politics were violent in those days and mary's father and uncle were strong tories she heard such bitter abuse of the liberals that her sense of justice was revolted and she adopted liberal opinions which she stuck to all her life mary fairfax was probably about fifteen when one day a friend showed her a monthly magazine containing coloured pictures of ladies dresses and puzzles she was surprised to see strange lines mixed up with letters in the puzzles in a way that she could not understand and asked her friend what they were she was told that they were a kind of arithmetic called algebra but her friend could not tell her what algebra was on going home she looked amongst the family books to see if there was one which would explain algebra she could only find one about navigation which she studied though she could but dimly understand it she had no one of whom she could ask questions and knew that she would only be laughed at if she spoke of her desire for knowledge so that she often felt sad and forlorn but she managed to teach herself enough greek to read xenophon and herodotus the next winter she spent in edinburgh again and was sent to a drawing school and got on well with drawing but it was not till the following summer when her youngest brother was studying with a tutor that she ventured to ask the tutor to get her books about algebra and euclid and she was able to begin the studies which were to make her famous as a mathematician she worked very hard for she had many household duties to perform and to spend much time on music and painting which were the only studies of which her mother approved she could only study mathematics by sitting up late at night and burnt so many candles that the servants complained to her mother and her candle was ordered to be taken away when she went to bed then she used to keep up her studies by going over in the dark what she had already learnt by this time mary was grown up and was a remarkably pretty girl very small and delicate looking she began to go out to parties in edinburgh which she much enjoyed and where she was much admired but all the time she never lost sight of what she felt to be the main purpose of her life the pursuit of her studies she painted at the art school she practised her piano for five hours every day she made all her own dresses even her ball dresses she spent her evenings working and talking with her mother to get time for her other studies she used to rise at daybreak and after dressing wrapped herself in a blanket to keep warm and read algebra or classics till breakfast time so amidst difficulties of all kinds she struggled on with her studies no one except her uncle dr somerville ever gave her any help or encouragement when she was twenty-four mary fairfax married her cousin samuel grieg and went to live in london her husband was out at his work all day and she had plenty of time for her studies but though he did not interfere with what she did he gave her no help or encouragement he knew nothing of science himself and did not believe that women were capable of intellectual work she struggled on as best she could and took lessons in french so as to learn to speak it after three years her husband died leaving her with two little boys one of whom did not live to grow up mary went back to live with her parents she cared for her children with the utmost tenderness but she still devoted herself to her mathematical studies and she was able to get advice and help from a professor in edinburgh to get time to study she still rose early for during most of the day she was busy with her children and the evening she devoted to her father people thought her queer and foolish because she did not go into society but she did not care for their criticisms and made real progress in her studies 
she had several proposals of marriage but refused them all till in eighteen twelve she agreed to marry her cousin dr william somerville son of the uncle who had been the only person to help her in her studies when she was a girl when her engagement was known one of dr somerville's sisters who was younger than herself and unmarried wrote to her saying she hoped she would give up her foolish manner of life and studies and make a respectable and useful wife to her brother this made dr somerville very indignant and he wrote a severe and angry letter to his sister after this none of her family dared to interfere with his wife again his father was delighted with his choice for he understood and loved his niece some of the family were much astonished when in the summer after the marriage they were staying together in the lakes and one of them fell ill and expressed a wish for currant jelly to find that mrs somerville in spite of her learning was able at once to make some excellent jelly the marriage was an absolutely happy one dr somerville loved and admired his wife and was very proud of her learning for the first time she had encouragement to pursue her studies instead of having obstacles thrown in her way at first they lived in edinburgh but in eighteen sixteen dr somerville received an appointment in london and they moved there and settled in hanover square many friends gathered round them and mrs somerville enjoyed intercourse with other learned people especially with sir william herschel the great astronomer she not only went on with her scientific studies but she took lessons in painting she and her husband enjoyed making together a collection of minerals they added to it on their travels in france and italy which were an immense delight to her several children were born to mrs somerville but only one son of her first marriage and two daughters of her second marriage lived to grow up she was a devoted mother and gave much time to the care of her children she gave her morning hours to domestic duties and was determined that her daughters should not suffer as she had done from want of a good education she taught them herself all the subjects she was able to teach giving three hours to their lessons every morning her house was carefully managed and she used to read the newspapers diligently as she was keenly interested in politics she read too all the most important new books on all kinds of subjects science was her special study but she loved poetry and read all the great authors in latin and greek as well as in french and italian she was very fond of music and devoted to painting and was very clever and neat with her needle and she also enjoyed society very much miss edgeworth the novelist after meeting her in eighteen twenty two described her as small and slight with smiling eyes and a charming face quiet and modest in her ways with a very soft voice and a pleasant scotch accent she said of her while her head is among the stars her feet are firm upon the earth mrs somerville never herself introduced learned subjects into general talk but when others did she spoke of them simply and naturally without assuming any superior knowledge yet of course other learned people soon found out how much she knew when she was in edinburgh she had written at the request of the editor a learned article on comets for the quarterly review but she had no idea of writing any book till in eighteen twenty seven a letter came from lord brougham to dr somerville asking whether mrs somerville would write for a series he was interested in a book on a very important french work about the stars written by the famous astronomer laplace mrs somerville had met laplace in paris he had said of her that she was the only woman who could understand his works and lord brougham wrote that she was the only person who could write the book he wanted and if she would not write it it must be left undone mrs somerville writes herself that she was surprised beyond expression by this letter she thought lord brougham must be mistaken as to her powers and that it would be very presumptuous in her to attempt to write on such a subject or indeed on any other however lord brougham called in person to press his request and at last she agreed on condition that no one should know what she was trying to do and that if she failed the manuscript should be put into the fire 
she had now to try to make time for more work in her busy life. This she did by getting up earlier to see to her household duties, but she was much disturbed by interruptions. People did not think that a woman was like a man and could have any real work to do. Frequently friends or relations would arrive when she was in the midst of a difficult problem and say, I have come to spend a few hours with you. She had no other room to work in but the drawing room, and as soon as the bell warned her of a visitor, she used to cover up her books and papers with a piece of muslin so that no one should know what she was doing. She learnt by habit to put up with interruptions, and to go back at once when alone again to the point where she had left off. She did her work in the same room where her children prepared their lessons after she had taught them, and she was never impatient when they brought their little difficulties to her, but answered them quickly and quietly and went back to her own work. She could so abstract her mind that even talking or practicing on the piano did not disturb her. When the book was finished and sent to be looked at, Mrs. Somerville felt very nervous as to what might be thought of it. It made her very happy and proud when the great astronomer Sir John Herschel wrote to say that he had read it with the highest admiration and added, Go on thus, and you will leave a memorial of no common kind to posterity, and what you will value far more than fame, you will have accomplished a most useful work. Her book was received with immense praise, the scientific societies hastened to show her honor. Her bust was ordered to be executed by the great sculptor Chantry and placed in the hall of the Royal Society of London, and at the Prime Minister's request, the King granted her a pension of two hundred pounds a year. The relations who had found fault with her ways were now astonished at her success and were loud in her praise but most of all she valued the deep delight of her husband, who had always encouraged her and whose pride in her knew no bounds. After this success, other scientific books were written by Mrs. Somerville. Much of her work was done in Italy, where they went on account of Dr. Somerville's health. In Rome, as in London, Mrs. Somerville never allowed anything to interfere with her morning's work, but in the afternoon she enjoyed keenly going about to see the wonderful sights of the city or making excursions into the country. She wrote to her son in 1841 that she had undertaken a book more fit for the combination of a society than for a single hand to accomplish. This was her book on physical geography, with which she was at first so dissatisfied that she wished to burn it but her husband begged her to send it to Sir John Herschel, who advised that it should be published, and it went through six editions. In 1860, Mrs. Somerville had the great sorrow of losing her husband, who died in Florence at the age of 89. One who knew them well and had only lately seen them together spoke of them as giving the most beautiful instance of united old age. Mrs. Somerville continued to live in Italy with her two daughters, first at Spezia and afterwards in Naples. To the last, she worked on writing a new book, bringing out new editions of her old books, and working at them so as to include in them the latest scientific discoveries. She used to study in bed every day from eight in the morning until twelve or one o'clock. A little bird, a mountain sparrow, was her constant companion for eight years, and would sit and even go to sleep on her arm while she wrote. It was a real sorrow when one day it disappeared and was found drowned in a water jug. She still painted and enjoyed sketching the beautiful view that could be seen from her windows. In 1869 there was an agitation in England to gain for women the right to vote in parliamentary elections. Mrs. Somerville thought decidedly that women ought to have the vote, and signed petitions for it, and she felt it to be an honor to be put on the General Committee for Woman's Suffrage in London. She thought that in many ways the laws were unjust to women, and also that there was still a strong prejudice against the higher education of women. She was much interested in all that was being done in England to improve girls' education remembering well her own difficulties as a girl, 
and heard with much delight of the establishment of the women's colleges at Cambridge. After her death, one of the first women's colleges at Oxford was named after her Somerville College. In 1868, she was much interested in a tremendous eruption of Mount Vesuvius, the volcano which she could see from her windows on the other side of the Bay of Naples. Day after day, she watched with a telescope the glowing streams of lava and the flame and smoke which burst from the mountain, carrying with it great rocks into the air. It was a great pleasure to her to see some distinguished men of science who came from England to see the eruption, and who spent an evening with her during which she enjoyed much scientific conversation. Mrs. Somerville lived to a great old age. When she was ninety, her eyesight and the powers of her mind were still perfectly good. She still studied science and the higher mathematics in the early morning hours, Afterwards, she would read Shakespeare or Dante or Homer in the original. She regularly read the newspapers and enjoyed a cheerful novel in the evening or a game of bezique with her daughters. It was for her a constant joy to watch the sunsets over the Bay of Naples, the flowers or seaweeds which her daughters brought in from their walks, or the tame birds she had in her room were always a delight. She had ever been deeply religious and everything in nature spoke to her of the great God who had created all things, whilst the laws which were revealed to her in her scientific studies gave her ever new cause to love and adore her heavenly Father. Friends from England and Italy came often to see her, for she was much beloved. Her only infirmity was that she was very deaf, but no one, young or old, thought it a hardship to sit by the little, sweet, frail old lady and tell her about the things that were going on in the world outside, in which she still took so keen an interest. Even when she was ninety-two, she would drive out sometimes for several hours. She often forgot recent events and the names of people, but she wrote herself at the age of ninety-two, I am still able to read books on the higher algebra for four or five hours in the morning, and even to solve the problems. Sometimes I find them difficult, but my old obstinacy remains, for if I do not succeed today, I attack them again on the morrow. I also enjoy reading about all the new discoveries and theories in the scientific world and in all branches of science. She thought much of the last journey that lay before her, but wrote that it did not disturb her tranquillity, for although deeply sensible of her utter unworthiness, she trusted in the infinite mercy of her almighty creator. Tended by the loving care of her daughters, she was perfectly happy. Her beautiful life ended in perfect peace, and her pure spirit passed away so gently that those around her scarcely perceived that she had left them. She died in her sleep one morning at the age of ninety-two. End of section nine.